Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, I'd like to thank you for coming bright and early, uh, especially those who live on the West Coast. I know it's brutal to wake up early, but I'm hoping that this morning's meeting will be fruitful for everyone, uh, especially uh, those in the clinical practice uh, area. My name is Nick Hanania. I, um, I'm a faculty here, and I was asked to chair this conference this morning, and it's my pleasure to be here. I have a few uh, things to announce before I introduce our first speaker and before I go through the case uh, that I prepared to start off this meeting. Uh, welcome to this symposium. This is the STEP Asthma and COPD Similarities and Differences Symposium. I would like to thank Forest Laboratories for the education grant to support this program, as well as Boringer Ingelheim for the restricted education uh, grant for this program. Uh, we will be utilizing the ARS system. Uh, please take a minute and look and get familiar with the uh, keyboard or keypads that you have on your table. Uh, each faculty was asked to prepare a few questions that we will uh, use. Uh, we will collect uh, the responses initially and we'll run a post pre-test pre and a post-test type of uh, um, uh, uh, sessions and, and, and we'll uh, Hopefully, we'll, we'll collect some data uh, as well regarding the knowledge that is being given during this meeting. Um, we will conclude this session with a panel discussion, a question and answer session, where I will ask the panelists to come here and join me on the podium, and we will be collecting question and answer cards. Uh, so uh, please, if you have any questions, please write them down, and some ushers will be coming around to, to pick these cards. There is also an evaluation form included in your handout. This is very important so that the college will know how to improve and, and get feedback from you as well as uh, uh, for future programs. In addition, you can apply for CME uh, credit online. Uh, there are directions in your syllabus how to get the, the CME uh, uh, credits for this program. The overall objectives of this symposium uh, are as follows. One, describe pathologic, physiologic, cellular, and biomarker similarities and differences between asthma and COPD. Uh, apply knowledge appropriately to clinical scenarios for asthma and COPD. And delineate the similarities and differences in treating asthma and, and COPD. Uh, I, I, I have my, the pleasure of having two other faculty here who I will introduce in a few minutes. Uh, uh, to join us to, in this meeting. I'm going to start uh, off um, by asking uh, just housekeeping things, just for the sake of other attendees and our faculty as well. If you have a cell phone or a pager, please put it on the mute, uh, just because we don't want to disturb everybody here. And I truly appreciate that. Thank you. So uh, get your keypads ready, because I'll, I'll, I'll go over a case scenario and, and I prepared a few questions and, and then we'll start off with uh, Dr. Bremen who will follow this. Okay, so please, uh, there, there are some demographic questions. We won't know who you are, just please uh, uh, key in, are you an ACCP member, yes or no? Okay, your age, and that's become sensitive here, but we won't know who you are, don't worry. Pick an age range. So most of you are middle aged, like me. I guess young, young, I would say, at heart. What is your gender? Okay. And your specialty? Okay. 
quickly. And which category best describes your practice, if you are in practice? And the number of years in practice. Do you influence equipment purchases at your institution? I have no idea why this question is there. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just a messenger, don't shoot me. Do you plan to on attending the PH self study station, which is at this conference? Do you plan to attend uh, the PH small case based interactive discussions? Okay, we're going to get started, and, uh, and as you see from your book uh, in front of you, we have uh, three talks. Uh, one would cover more the clinical aspect of differentiating asthma COPD, and Dr. Bremer will be presenting that. The second, I will be presenting uh, management protocols in asthma COPD, the similarities and differences. And then the third talk would be covered by Professor Casola from uh, Rome, Italy who would be talking about novel therapies in asthma COPD. Before that, I'll start with a, a brief case presentation uh, that depicts uh, the problem that we're talking about uh, here today. Here? Oh, oh okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's start with the case. Uh, so this is a case I've seen. I'm, I'm sure you've seen cases like this in your practice. This is Anne, who's 47-year-old, uh, overweight woman currently going through menopause, uh, complains of dyspnea while walking rapidly and climbing stairs, has bouts of very rapid breathing and inability to catch her breath during that, these episodes. Over the last few years, she has had difficulty taking care of the house. She does not have the energy to take walks or work in the garden. She reports asthma as a child, which she outgrew as a teenager. She's a former smoker and smoked one pack of cigarettes a day from the age 17 to 37. So that makes her 20 pack here smoker. She also has a history of recurrent respiratory infections and reports at least one bad chest cold every winter. Several uh, required visits to her physician and a course of antibiotic treatment. 
She also reports history of congestion and uh, uh, occasional nasal congestion for which she uses over-the-counter antihistaminics. Uh, she's been uh, using her son's uh, albiterol for rescue of her symptoms, but needed to have a refill um, because she's using it five to six times per day. She's not very communicative and does not demonstrate much affect uh, in describing her condition. She's concerned about her relationships with her husband and children, but believes that her condition is a normal part of the aging process. She states that she wants to make sure nothing is really wrong, and she apologizes for probably wasting your time. This is the initial evaluation. She's overweight and appears anxious. Uh, her vital signs, as you see here, her BMI is 30.5, and just uh, baseline weight and height are shown. Uh, but you can see on her blood pressure, pulse, respiratory rate, uh, not, nothing really abnormal. Probably a bit tachypnea, but nothing abnormal. Her physical exam reveals plus one bilateral pitting edema, uh, and her chest exam shows decreased breath sounds, prolonged expiratory um, time, and wheezing. She has ronchi throughout. Otherwise, her, abdominal, uh, her exam is, is, uh, is not revealing other than chest findings. And these are her labs, the baseline labs, uh, uh, the hemoglobin 14, a white count 5.5, and electrolytes, liver enzymes, normal, her kidney functions are normal. Her total IgE level is 450. Her EKG is within normal limits, and skin tests, which we, we did in the clinic, were positive for uh, multiple allergens. And the questions here, and what, please feel free to key key in your, what you believe is the best answer. Which one of the following laboratory tests may help differentiate asthma from COPD? A chest x-ray, lung volume measurement showing hyperinflation and gas trapping, diffusion capacity measurement, or IgE level? Now, I won't show you the answers here. We will show the answers at the end of the session. So this is her spirometry. You can see her FEV1 uh, is, uh, post-bronchodite FEV1 is 60% of predicted, and uh, she improves uh, by 300 milliliters or 24%, and her post-bronchodite FEV1 FVC is uh, 60%, didn't change. In, and this is the second question, differentiating asthma from COPD, which statement is true about spirometry? Significant bronchodilator response that is increased by 200 ml and 12% in either FE1 or FVC confirms the diagnosis of asthma. Bronchodilator response does not differentiate asthma from COPD. The absence of significant bronchodilator response confirms the diagnosis of COPD. A post-bronchodilator FE1 or FVC less than 70% confirms the diagnosis of asthma. Please key in the best answer based on your assessment. So this is her chest x-ray. Uh, a bit underpenetrated, as you see. Maybe there's some flattening of the diaphragm, but nothing else that uh, um, that is out of the ordinary. In differentiating asthma from COPD, which statement is true about chest X-ray? Presence of hyperinflation on chest X-ray is diagnostic of COPD. Chest X-ray is not a useful tool for differentiating asthma from COPD. Hyperinflation on chest X-ray is primarily caused by underlying emphysema. Chest X-ray is not usually required for the initial workup of patients with asthma or COPD. Please key in your best answer, or the only answer you think is right.
So this is, the, I think, the last question I had. Which statement is true regarding management of asthma and COPD? And this is a bit long. Let me read these and pick up one only. Pharmacologic management of asthma and COPD should focus on managing respiratory symptoms. Inhaled corticosteroids are pivotal medication in both asthma and COPD as airway inflammation is present in both diseases. Response to inhaled bronchodilators in COPD is primarily due to the decrease in hyperinflation of the lungs. Monotherapy with long-acting beta-2 agonists should be avoided in both asthma and COPD. Pick one answer. Okay, so I, I would like to introduce our uh, first speaker. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, our first speaker actually is Professor Brayman, and these are his questions, but I will read those in a minute. But let me introduce him first. Uh, Dr. Sidney Brayman, uh, who's Professor of Medicine and Director of Pulmonary Disease Management um, in the uh, Catherine and Henry Geisman Division of Pulmonary Critical Care Medicine at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. He's a past president of the American College of Chest Physician. And Dr. Brayman is, has been given the task to talk about uh, what differentiates asthma from COPD and does it matter? Um, and he'll be talking about uh, that in a minute. These are two questions he uh, has given. Choose the correct statement about asthma COPD. Asthma is always associated with eosinophilic inflammation of the airways. Sputum eosinophils are increased in both asthma and COPD exacerbations. Bronchoprovocation tests with methacholine and histamine can be used to distinguish asthma from COPD. Elevated levels of exhaled nitric oxide are diagnostic of asthma. Please choose one. Which of the following tests is more likely to be abnormal in asthma versus COPD? Uh, single breath diffusing capacity, bronchi bronchial inhalation challenge with methacholine, high resolution CT scan, or elevated CRP? Many asthmatics develop fixed airway disease resembling COPD. What statement about these asthmatics uh, is correct? In asthma, airflow is obstructed in the large airways, while in COPD, it is in the small airways. Both asthma and COPD are characterized by loss of diffusion surface and low DLCO. Sputum eosinophilia is a common feature of these asthmatics. FEV1 response to an inhaled bronchodilator can distinguish asthma from COPD.
All right, so we will go over the post-test after Dr. Brayman finishes his talk. And now it gives me the pleasure to introduce Dr. Brayman uh, to the podium. And he will be talking about what differentiates asthma from COPD and does it matter? Welcome, Sydney. Thank you so much, Nick. And good morning, everyone. Well, when Nick called me, asked me to speak about this topic, I figured, boy, this is easy, slam dunk. But as you've seen from some of the questions, it's not so easy. And while we all have a concept of this is asthma and this is COPD, uh, hopefully I'll convince you that, yes, there are some differences and some things that do differentiate the, the two diseases, but very often it is very difficult. So let's ponder this question. And at the very end, I'm going to give you some thoughts about why I do think it matters how we distinguish asthma and COPD. Uh, educational support, as you heard from Nick, has been received from uh, uh, both BI and Forest Laboratories. Uh, this is me. And uh, the faculty disclosure is part of, the, uh, uh, of every talk at this uh, session. I have received some consultant fees, as you see in the bottom, and the learning objectives. So through most of uh, the beginning of, uh, I guess, last century, uh, this question was a simple one. Asthma was asthma, COPD was COPD. But by mid-century, and as you see, 1961, a hypothesis arose that really shattered many people's ideas, certainly confronted what we call the British hypothesis, is that there is a distinction between asthma on the one hand and COPD on the other. It was called the Dutch hypothesis, and it suggested that asthma and COPD are different expressions of one disease with overlapping clinical features, and that one may actually evolve into the other. It suggested that many of the features of both, such as bronchial hyperresponsiveness, uh, allergen challenge uh, abnormalities, age, gender infection, smoking, genetic susceptibility, were of variable importance creating this, uh, this disease of obstructed airways. And as you see here from the um, little diagram on the bottom, that these factors go into causing this asthma and COPD, and that indeed there may be uh, this so-called overlap uh, of two diseases. Well, as I said, most of the 20th century, this was our concept. We knew asthma was asthma, and certainly COPD was chronic bronchitis and emphysema. We also recognized from this non-proportional Venn diagram, popularized by Gordon Snyder a number of years ago, uh, that there was a lot of overlap in these conditions. And that's really what this diagram was, was saying to us. By the 1990s, mid-90s, the last of the pure ATS uh, standards for COPD document came out. And indeed, it took this non-proportional Venn diagram and changed it. I remind you that just a few years before, the asthma guidelines came out, our NIH asthma guidelines came out, and a few years after, actually around the same time, the GINA guidelines came out, clearly talking about just asthma. So in that document in 1995, asthma, which was part of previous standard uh, documents, was eliminated. And we were just talking about the entity of COPD, chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So why was this done? And should it have been done? And is this Dutch hypothesis perhaps correct? Well, these are the questions that I'd like to consider with you this morning. The way I've sort of approached this is to take a look at the definition of asthma, what our concept, current concept is of asthma, and then in a few moments look at the definition of COPD and take those distinguishing features of these two conditions and see, are they so special, are they so distinct for this condition versus the COPD? So asthma is a chronic inflammatory disease. We'll talk a little bit about inflammation and a lot more will come up in, 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 in the next few talks. Many cells play a role. The susceptible individuals, uh, we've causes recurrent episodes of wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness. We know that the episodes are associated with widespread but variable airflow obstruction. It's at least 
partially reversible, either spontaneously or as a result of treatment. And of course, this inflammation is associated with increased bronchial responsiveness. So this is what we recognize of the features of asthma from the definition. Well, it talks about symptoms. We recognize that the symptoms of recurrent wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness, and cough with exacerbations are really similar to both. So we're not on clinical grounds going to make this easy differentiation. But what about these three distinguishing features? Let's discuss them. Inflammation, airflow obstruction, reversibility of the airflow obstruction, and bronchial hyperresponsiveness. From the definition, these should be fairly specific to asthma. Well, let's talk a little bit about airflow obstruction of asthma. And I'm going to present to you a paper not well uh, recognized. It was in a very prestigious journal, the Journal of Applied Physiology, that looked at features of airflow obstruction in asthma and COPD. And it was quite a brilliant study because it was looking at these features of the smaller airways in COPD, which we know from this uh, uh, lung biopsy, totally abnormal, narrowed, inflamed, thickened, and this airway of asthma, smaller airway, inflamed, narrow, thickened. And it looked at a site of an airflow obstruction in patients with asthma and patients with COPD. It used a fascinating technique with micromanometry. It actually took, they took a bronchoscope and, and awake individuals, passed it into the airways, passed through the scope a small catheter. At the tip of the catheter, there was a manometer that could measure pressure. And the catheter was wedged into a three millimeter airway, meaning that it could measure pressure from the pleura through an esophageal balloon to the tip of this catheter across the smaller airways from the tip of this catheter to the mouth pressure, which would then be central airways. And from the pleura to the mouth, we had total pulmonary resistance. So it was a way of separating resistances in the airways of these patients. It looked at a group of asthmatics, small group, but a group of asthmatics who had relatively normal function comparing them to normals. These are asthmatics who had the, their disease only a few years. Milder asthmatics in remission, relatively normal lung function, and as you see, fairly normal gas exchange with, with PO2. Resistance across the entire respiratory system, the so-called resistance of the lung, was fairly comparable and not distinct, distinctly different. But then it looked at two other group, or three other groups actually. Asthma, long standing, these are people who had had asthma for more than 20 years, and you can see resistance was high, and comparable to they tried to clinically in the 19, early 90s distinguish between chronic bronchitis and emphysema. I won't discuss how they try to do that, but you see that, air, that resistance was high in both of these and abnormal lung function, slightly lower in the emphysema cases. Gas exchange, pretty comparable. So this is the study group that they were looking at, a normal group, a, an asthmatic with relatively normal function, and these asthmatics with chronic airway uh, uh, abnormalities. Well, they showed us that the percentage of peripheral airway resistance compared to total airway resistance was relatively normal in the asthmatics, this group A, who didn't really have much in the way of airflow uh, obstruction. As you can see, it was slightly elevated, but clearly way out of the range of both as asthmatics chronic and the bronchitis and emphysema, the COPD group. Both in inspiration and expiration, it was done suggesting that these asthmatics with long-standing airflow obstruction had not only total increased airway resistance, but this resistance was in the peripheral airways. Patients with recent onset asthma, they concluded, had values of central and peripheral resistance similar to control subjects, slightly elevated but not statistically significant. Peripheral airway resistance was significantly elevated with long-standing asthma and COPD, very comparable, and peripheral airways are the main site of airway obstruction in these chronic asthmatics and COPD patients. So the answer is, there's not very much difference in these individuals once asthma has been present, 
for a number of years with this airflow obstruction. Well, let's talk about reversibility. We know that asthma is a highly reversible airway disease. And what about COPD? Well, earlier studies, and this one in the ERJ a number of years ago, showed what we know, that if you look at, in this case, both ipratropium as well as albuterol, and you give increasing uh, doses of, the, of either of these medications uh, and look at the change of FEV1, asthmatics will have a very brisk response, but COPD patients will have a response, certainly not as a group as great as asthma. Well, recent studies have suggested that this response in COPD may be a bit more brisk than we anticipated earlier. And indeed, from the uplift trial, which you recall is that four-year trial looking at teotropium, um, uh, Don Tashkin actually looked at the aspect of reversibility of airflow obstruction in the group that came into the trial. Remember, at the beginning of the trial, they had to have routine lung function studies, and as part of that, they had uh, a challenge with both ipratropium and uh, albuterol. And you can see here that the great majority had significant airway uh, reversibility. And these are not mild asthmatics. The average FEV1 in this group was almost th uh, around 40 percent. But look at the tremendous robust response in FEV1 to an inhaled bronchodilator, showing some of them 25, 30, 35 percent improvement in FEV1. Obviously, the numbers are small because they were obstructed, but yet, similar to asthma, a large number of patients with COPD will have reversibility consistent with what Nick had mentioned earlier, the 12 percent or 200 cc's, or they, another criteria they use was an improvement of 15 percent or more. So reversibility in asthma, yes. Reversibility in COPD, very common. Well, bronchial hyper-responsiveness. We know that asthmatics will tell you that they go into uh, uh, the field and they're allergic to grass, they wheeze. They have uh, uh, bus fumes as they're walking down the street, uh, they inhale, they wheeze. Uh, they have twitchy airways, bronchial hyper-responsiveness, clearly a feature of asthma in the definition of asthma. Can't have asthma without it. Well, the challenge was done, and Wilcock a number of years ago looked at both asthma, COPD, and normals looking at both methacholine and histamine challenge, reminding you that these two challenges are direct, <clears throat> uh, uh, directly affect airway smooth muscle. They're not indirect challenges. They're so-called direct challenges. And you can see here that, in general, yes, asthmatics have <clears throat> greater bronchial hyperactivity. You can see here the dose of the agonist, maybe, uh, dose of the agonist as it increases. <clears throat> Obviously, we see greater bronchial reactivity. But there is considerable overlap here. Many as COPD patients will show moderate bronchial hyperactivity. And while some normals even have slight bronchial activity, as a matter of fact, in population studies, about 9% of normals will show abnormal bronchial reactivity. And even more fascinating is if you follow these people along prospectively, these normal individuals with bronchial hyperactivity will develop asthma. Many of them will develop asthma. And if they happen to be cigarette smokers, they have a much more likely chance of getting COPD. So the feature of bronchial hyperactivity appears to be uh, something that we see in COPD, obviously very necessary uh, for the diagnosis of asthma. If you look at the results of the lung health study, which I remind you came out in the mid-90s, the study was done to really look at the effects of smoking cessation uh, on, on the airways of COP mild COPD patients, 63% of men, 87% of women showed bronchial hyperresponsiveness, meaning a 20% fall in FEV1. Uh, with, this was a methacholine challenge, indicating airway hyperresponsiveness. They found that bronchial hyperresponsiveness actually had a negative prognostic sign, was a negative prognostic indicator associated with an accelerated decline in FEV1 over time. It's associated with increased mortality. And same, interestingly, smoking cessation has a very positive effect and improves uh, when one does FEV1 greater than those uh, who have uh, bronchial hyperresponsiveness. So it's a common feature of COPD seen in many patients, and it really is not a good distinguisher between the two. Well, let's look at the other side. What has Gold told us about <clears throat> COPD? Common preventable disease. We know persistent airway limitation, progressive 
associated with an inflammatory response of the airways to lungs, noxious particles and gases. Exacerbations and uh, comorbidities contribute to the onset uh, and, and, the, and the overall severity. So the features of COPD, <coughs> excuse me, progressive disease, abnormal inflammatory response <coughs> in the airways, and significant extrapulmonary effects. Well, let's look at the opposite. What about asthma? Progressive disease, absolutely. This has been shown even way back in, in, in the 1980s uh, by this uh, study from, uh, from Pete showing that normals versus a large asthmatic population have a greater decline. This was substantiated in the New England Journal, Langs uh, et al. Uh, also showed very similar, both smokers and non-smokers with asthma have an accelerated decline. We know this is the feature of COPD. Oops. Um, when we look at this group of individuals who do have this decline, obviously not all asthmatics, this is an average, we find out several things. Number one, that the decline is not as rapid as COPD. The 50, 60 cc's or more drop per year in FEV1 and COPD is not matched in asthma. The changes are greater than the normal, 25 maybe, plus or minus, maybe in the range of 30 or 5 or so. Uh, but clearly, if you look at a population of asthmatics, many will show this accelerated decline, just like the COPD patients. And indeed, <clears throat> if you look at <clears throat> a group of patients <clears throat> with asthma, this is an absolutely fascinating uh, finding. This was on 10,000 patients who were entered into a variety of asthma trials. <clears throat> this was <clears throat> excuse me, published in around 2005. So these are trials prior to that time. These are pharmaceutical trials. Looking at, at entry, post-bronchodilator FEV1, you can see here that the percent of patients with an abnormal post-bronchodilator FEV1, certainly the criteria we use for COPD, number one, increases with the age of this group who entered in the trial. But look at the numbers. 45 plus percent of patients entering a trial, these are asthmatics, had a post-bronchodilator FEV1 less than 70 percent, persistent airway obstruction. Obviously, the, the translation is the longer you have the asthma, the older that you are, we recognize that the greater the chance of having, thanks, uh, ha greater the chance of having fixed airway obstruction. Similar to COPD. What about the inflammation of the airways? Well, <clears throat> this should be easy. COPD, the neutrophilic bronchitis, you look at the airways of uh, uh, a sputum of COPD patients, you see a lot of neutrophils. Asthma, the eosinophilic uh, bronchitis. Well, perhaps not so easy. <clears throat> we know that not only are there increased eosinophils in asthma and asthma exacerbations, but look what happens in COPD. In this study from Maria Sayeta, indeed, <clears throat> during the exacerbation, eosinophil, in this case, uh, looking at the marker of eosinophils, uh, it, it goes up. And other studies have shown certainly increased numbers of eosinophils <clears throat> in the COPD exacerbation. <clears throat> and indeed, Jim Hogg told us that when one looks at the airways of the COPD patient, looking at various gold stages, remember the old days we had gold stage zero, but looking at milder, more moderate, and some more severe patients with COPD, <clears throat> that he showed that polys, macrophages, and eosinophils increased in these airways. And surprisingly, the CD4 cell, which we think about with asthma, the CD8 cell, of course, we think COPD also increased as also, sorry, the, uh, the B cells are increased later in the stage of disease. <clears throat> so can we really differentiate these diseases just based on s the cells we see in the sputum or even a bronchial biopsy? To complicate matters, Sally Wenzel showed us that as asthma becomes more severe, that we see here from normal group to moderate or mild asthma to severe patients, that there is increased neutrophilic inflammation. Here we see in the orange neutrophils as opposed to eosinophil inflammation <clears throat> in severe steroid-dependent asthmatics. So we see this reversal, seeing what we recognize in COPD, neutrophilic bronchitis, in these asthmatics uh, when they become more severe. Again, complicating this picture of inflammation in asthma and COPD. Well, maybe the answer is in bronchial biopsies. 
not that we're going to send our patients for bronchial biopsies when we are uh, confronting them in the, in the office or in the clinic and saying, gee, does this patient have asthma or COPD? <clears throat> but let's see if indeed the bronchial biopsies will, will, uh, will distinguish the two. <clears throat> this was a fascinating study. Um, I think it was done at Mayo. But there were three pathologists who were chosen, pulmonary pathologists. They were blinded. They were given specimens, 50 specimens, of 50 asthma patients and 50 COPD patients. As you can see from the bottom, current routine analysis procedures to assess endobronchial biopsy specimens was not discriminatory. So let's look at some of their findings. Yes, epithelial desquamation was seen in asthma. This is the range in the three of them, uh, COPD. You can see that, A, they didn't totally agree with each other, and indeed there was a lot of overlap between asthma and COPD in ep ep epithelial desquamation, basement membrane thickening, uh, obviously tended to be more associated with asthma, but again, there was overlap. Eosinophils strongly biased the pathologic diagnosis in favor of asthma, but when you really looked at the prevalence, they were very similar in these, in these two. So the pathologists couldn't decide and distinguish between asthma and COPD on bronchial biopsies in this article uh, published in, in Thorax. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, this was a British study a couple of years ago. Well, we're in an age of biomarkers. And while we're fairly early in this stage of biomarkers, really trying to uh, uh, distinguish diseases in general, um, here is a study that Leo Fabri put out a couple of years ago where he took a group of patients with asthma, long-standing asthma, clearly asthma, smokers over on this side with COPD, these asthmatics were non-smokers, and they were all around age 60 plus. Uh, so these are people who had a long-standing asthma and obviously well-developed COPD. They were, had comparable FEV1s. And when they looked at, let's look on the right here, of exhaled NO, yes, in general, the levels of exhaled NO were higher in asthmatics. We do not use, obviously, exhaled NO to diagnose asthma, as one of your questions asked you. Uh, but certainly, there was some crossover. Some patients with COPD had an elevated, and the authors concluded that one cannot use a value of exhaled nitric oxide to distinguish asthma and COPD. The one study that they found that was distinguishing, unfortunately, we don't do. How many of you have seen a sputum eosinophil count done from your laboratory? This is not done in this country. There was an excellent editorial, a pro-con, this past year uh, in chest looking at, uh, uh, on the one hand, Hargraves said, yes, we should do it. Steve Peters said, no, we're not going to do it. Now, the truth of the matter is, it would be a very helpful tool, but obviously it's not done. It's very labor intensive, and there are a lot of issues with it. But indeed, uh, he, could, he showed here that a, a certain sputum, it is eosinophil count uh, in the sputum, uh, would be a distinguisher, but uh, certainly this is not a test that's very clinically relevant. So question, can we really distinguish asthma uh, from COPD? Yeah, you see this all the time. How many patients with COPD have, look like this, have a severe airflow obstruction, severe attack, and all of a sudden return to near normal, or have mild disease over time, and then there's sudden fluctuation? This is the natural history of, of, of most of our asthmatics, which we know from our clinics. We can't define it, describe it, and quantify it, but we know that this is the natural history of our patients. On the other hand, the progressive slow decline in FEV1 in most patients. Does that mean all asthmatics have this chaotic pattern? No. All COPD patients will have this. E even in the lung health study, uh, only about a third of the patients who were defined with airflow obstruction, even if they smoke, continue to, on this slippery slope to get COPD. So it is, I think, a, kind of a confusing issue. Certainly, asthma is episodic disease with periods of complete remission, usually beginning in childhood. We don't see complete remission, really, in COPD. COPD, progressive condition early in the disease. Patients are asymptomatic. As it worsens in middle age and beyond, the dyspnea and exacerbation has become more common. Uh, spirometry, obviously, if it shows complete reversibility, is probably the only test that we can use to really define, because COPD, by definition, has a post-bronchodilator FEV1 that's abnormal, uh, less than 70 percent, uh, 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 ratio less than 70 percent. So I think that's the one thing. We certainly know that emphysema can be easily seen on CT scans. Here is a moderately severe centrolobular emphysema not seen in, in asthma. There is no lung destruction in asthma. And indeed, if this is seen, this would be at least diagnostic that, that COPD is present. The problem is we recognize that perhaps as, uh, as many as upwards of 20% of patients appear to be 
overlap syndrome. They have a little bit of both. About 30 percent of asthmatics across this country have either currently or have been previously smokers. So we recognize there's going to be a large number of patients who really do have uh, the overlap uh, uh, syndrome. Uh, but indeed, if you do have COPD, with loss of surface area, the DLCO may be low, but of course it could be as well normal too. Asthma, on the other hand, you would not see a, a, a low DL. Uh, if anything, it may be high because of the increased uh, uh, diffusing surface uh, as lung hyperinflation occurs. One important difference is this. Indeed, asthma versus COPD, there are a number of systemic consequences in, 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 in COPD, uh, the osteoporosis, the muscle uh, uh, wasting, and so forth. And certainly this has not been described in asthma. We also recognize that <clears throat> as systemic inflammation rises with, with COPD, uh, it is related to the severity of COPD, as shown here with CRP, tumor necrosis factor alpha, that as the COPD worsens, uh, there is greater amounts of, uh, uh, of these uh, uh, substances in the blood. <clears throat> However, if one looks in the literature, one will find that there is, not in, to this magnitude, increased CRP in the level of uh, many asthmatics. Uh, so while that probably it's not going to be a very distinguishing factor, and most people do not use these tests to distinguish the two. So final minute. I've shown you how difficult it is to distinguish asthma, distinguish COPD, both of them having evidence of airflow obstruction, particularly of over chronic disease in those smaller airways, very comparable, both having significant reversibility in, in most patients, <clears throat> both having a progressive decline of lung function greater in COPD. So I think that many of these classic features really can be seen, and then, of course, then there is this uh, overlap syndrome. But does it matter? And my answer is yes. Certainly it matters in studying drugs and clinical trials. I think that would be uh, obviously important. <clears throat> yes, it matters uh, when a primary care physician will, uh, will be afraid to use, uh, for example, a long-acting beta agonist because he's afraid that he can't distinguish asthma and COPD, <clears throat> and he doesn't want to give it to a COPD patient because he may have asthma. Uh, yes, it does matter for one other, uh, one other uh, reason, and that is that we've seen a steady decline of asthma deaths uh, since uh, the late 90s, a very positive thing. Of course, we still have a long way to go. And I think that there is a better recognition now that asthma is not just one disease, that yes, we have many phenotypic expressions of asthma, and indeed, many endotypic expressions of asthma, meaning different mechanisms of disease. And as we begin to cone down and look at some of these important mechanisms of disease, I think future therapeutic efforts are going to be available to us and improve specific subgroups of these asthmatics. <clears throat> and this is the lesson I think we've learned uh, fr from, from asthma, and indeed, hopefully we'll learn with COPD. While there has been a slight drop, at least in, as you see here in, uh, in, in men, death in women has not really changed, uh, you can see here over the last uh, decade or so. And I think that this, this approach in distinguishing some of these phenotypic and endotypic features <clears throat> of COPD in the future, uh, just like they are being done with asthma, I think will be helpful. So I, yes, I think it does matter. I think it's important to distinguish these diseases. So I'll leave you with one more quote, not comforting by any means, from the ATS ERS guidelines, 2004. <clears throat> Some patients with asthma cannot be distinguished from COPD with the current diagnostic tests. This was true in 2004. It's true in 2012. And they go on to remind us that the management of these patients should be similar to that with asthma. With that, I thank you so much for your attention. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Bremen. And uh, we're going to take questions at the end, as I mentioned. Please jot down any questions you have on the cards. Uh, I'm going to go over the questions that Dr. Bremen submitted and you had answered. So we'll do a post-test quickly. And, uh, uh, let's see the questions, post-test. Okay, uh, choose the correct statement about asthma and COPD. Asthma is always associated with eosinophilic inflammation of the airways. Sputum eosinophils are increased in both asthma and COPD exacerbations. Bronchoprovocation tests with methacholine and histamine can be used to distinguish asthma from COPD. Elevated levels of exhaled NO 
are diagnostic of asthma. Please choose one. We usually have music with when this thing. Yes. I can't sing. Not, not at this time of the day. I guess the system is compiling your answers. Maybe it's conflicting now with all the answers and Okay, sputum businesses are increasing both as 56% got this right. Okay, next question. And we got some improvement from pre-test to post-test. Okay. Which of the following tests is more likely to be abnormal in asthma versus COPD, DLCO, bronchial inhalation challenge with methacholine, high-resolution CT scan, elevated CRP? Okay, bronchial challenge with methacholine, 39%, got it right. All right. Many asthmatics develop fixed airway disease resembling COPD. What statement about these asthmatics is correct? In asthma, airflow is obstructed in the large airways, while in COPD, it is in the small airways. Both asthma and COPD are characterized by a loss of diffusion surface and a low DLCO. Sputum eosinophilia is a common feature of these asthmatics. FEV1 response to an inhaled bronchodilator can distinguish asthma from COPD. Okay, sputum is infill. All right, so let's uh, move on. Okay, so my task is really to, in a 20 minute uh, time period, to go over management protocols in asthma versus COPD and, and, and are there similarities and what are the differences. I do have the education support we already talked about and and uh, you have my faculty disclosure in your handout, uh, uh, which I won't read at uh, this point. These are my learning objectives for the, this particular talk. I want to apply knowledge appropriately to clinical scenarios in asthma COPD. Particularly, I want to uh, really uh, talk about the approach to management in this session. So this is my ambitious outline. I'm going to talk initially about what are the management guidelines for asthma COPD and, and, and outline similarities but also differences. Talk about differences in non-pharmacologic and then pharmacologic approaches. We obviously have multiple guidelines for asthma COPD. The international guidelines are the GINA and the GOLD guidelines, and I refer to those since we, this is an international conference, and obviously we do have uh, the NIH asthma guidelines in the U.S. as well as the ATS uh, guidelines as, as well. So uh, I refer to those as well during my discussion. So if you look at the goals of asthma and COPD management in general, they're very similar in a way. We want to get these patients better. We want to improve their symptoms, improve their lung function, improve their quality of life and decrease and prevent exacerbation. And ultimately, we want to prevent mortality. But the difference is, is achieving the goals of these uh, management goals. Is, it's been always re more rewarding uh, to treat asthma because we can achieve most of the goals listed on this slide with the current uh, treatment approaches. We're still trying to hard to, to achieve uh, the goals of COPD management we, while we can achieve the relief of symptoms improve exercise tolerance and quality of life and decrease exacerbation with multiple avenues we have um, right now, we're still trying to work hard on the first and the last goal, which are not 
usually achieved by the current medications and current interventions, other than smoking cessation, obviously, which is the most important. Now, what do the guidelines suggest we do? Well, assessment of asthma uh, is, has been outlined very nicely by both the GINA, but also the NIH expert panel report, and both emphasize the fact that uh, assessing asthma control is a major task that needs to be done uh, so that you can decide on the management strategy. And this is just a capture of what uh, the NIH uh, guidelines suggest we do in, in assessing control in patients with uh, asthma uh, who are above 12, but very similar, they recommend the same for children as well. Uh, and uh, young kids with asthma. And basically is assessment of impairment and assessment of risks. Impairment is based on assessment of uh, symptoms during the day, night symptoms, use of rescue medicine, activity limitation. Of course, lung function is there, but it's not the only thing. And then they recommend using questionnaires to assess asthma control. They also emphasize that assessment of risk, particularly risk of exacerbation, is very important. Along that line, the COPD new gold guidelines has actually adopted very similar reducing risk, reducing impairment type of approach for management of COPD. So the newest guidelines now don't focus only on lung function, but certainly as, uh, do focus on assessment of symptoms. Assessment of lung function is important, but they added a very, two other assessments, uh, which is assessment of risk of exacerbations and comorbidities for the first time in their latest update in October of last year. So assessment of symptoms of COPD is suggested by the gold guidelines, and they suggest two tools. One is the MRC dyspnea scale, uh, is it from zero to four, but also use of CAT questionnaire, uh, COPD assessment test, which is a validated questionnaire, but has not really gained popularity in the United States yet, but it certainly can be used in assessing these patients. Assessment of lung function, nothing has changed from that point compared to the previous gold guidelines. Assessment of lung function is based on cutoffs of post-bronchodilator FEV1, as you see here, and it's the stage one, two, three, and four, just like we were used to using before. But then what the guidelines suggested is we also assess exacerbation risk, and any patient who has two or more exacerbations in the preceding year is suggested to be in a high-risk uh, group, as well as any patient who has two or more on the MRC dyspnea scale is also high symptom uh, risk uh, patient, as well as FEV1 cutoff of 50% or lower is, uh, is also our patients with high risks. Therefore, using these three uh, assessment tools, you can see um, comorbidities are not built in this equation. Uh, we have the category A, B, C, and D groups, uh, the C and D being the high-risk patients who have more symptoms, more risk of exacerbation, and lower lung function. And the guidelines, as you'll see in a minute, they suggest we approach the treatment based on this assessment uh, and not just based on lung function alone. Now, non-pharmacologic approaches in asthma COPD are very important and certainly are not, not stressed enough in, uh, in, uh, in our practice. And we really go over medication the first time we see the patients and we just uh, concentrate on that. But we forget sometimes that these non-pharmacologic approaches are important. Uh, in general, the management approaches in asthma COPD has similarities in a way that both have non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic approaches. A step-up approach to therapy is very similar, uh, is suggested in both asthma and COPD according to severity and control of the disease or stability of the disease. Uh, in general, the main differences in management is management of asthma is really focused on treating inflammation and not symptoms alone. Uh, and management of COPD is really symptom-based at this point because we don't have any treatment uh, that is, uh, can change the natural history of COPD uh, that we can use for these patients. So let's go over the non-pharmacologic approaches for asthma. Obviously, I'm not going to go through these in details. Avoiding and identifying triggers are very important, and that includes allergy assessment, uh, as well as a very good history, both occupational and environmental history. Treating underlying comorbidities and uh, conditions that make asthma worse, including allergic rhinitis, sinusitis, GE reflux, uh, uh, 
uh, as well as a, of paramount importance uh, is asthma education. We tend to forget that this is a chronic disease and compliance is a major issue and, and these patients should be educated on their disease, about their medication, how to use their medicine devices, and so on. And not only one time, but on a regular continuous basis. Similarly, in COPD, where the most important non-pharmacologic approach, although it may include pharmacologic treatments, is smoking cessation. This is of paramount importance in this disease. Having said that, we have to remember that about 30, 25 to 30 percent of our asthmatics smoke. So smoke is not a differentiating factor, and certainly smoking cessation should be targeting both groups uh, of patients. But it is particularly important in COPD because the majority of patients with COPD have smoked or are current smokers when they come to us. And obviously here there is a 5A approach, and obviously we have to assist them uh, with pharmacologic therapies if they plan to quit smoking. Vaccination is advised in both asthma, COPD, influenza vaccine has been shown to be safe in both groups and should be given every year. The pneumococcal vaccine is suggested to be used, although there are no large grade A evidence trials in COPD. It's certainly something that the guidelines suggest we do, as well as optimizing nutrition and obviously oxygen therapy in those hypoxemic patients. And very important is the pulmonary rehabilitation, which is really not, has not been studied well in chronic asthma, but has been in COPD and has been shown to be very efficacious. And then finally, one of the differentiating factors is surgical interventions. Right now, we really don't have any surgical interventions for severe asthma, while we do in emphysema patients. Bronchoscopic intervention, however, has been implemented in asthma in severe disease, but, uh, but it's still in the research area in COPD for lung volume reduction. So when you look at COPD non-pharmacologic management, it also takes this step-up approach so that all these patients have to be educated about stopping smoking and avoiding risk factors, improving activity. Uh, pulmonary rehab should be considered as early as stage or grade B or patients who are symptomatic despite medication. And in those more severe patients, uh, evaluation for oxygen as well as considering surgical evaluation should be considered. Now, bronchial thermoplasty, as I said, has been implemented in severe asthma, and this is the large multicenter study looking at bronchial thermoplasty in patients with severe asthma who are on high-dose inhaled steroids, showing improvement in quality of life in the treatment arm versus the sham arm, as well as decreased healthcare utilization has been shown in this study. Although bronchoscopic evaluation of COPD has been done, at least in the emphysema patients, uh, these uh, studies using other plugs, sealants, decompression or spirals or valves, these are all still in the research arena, and even using STEAM has been also tested in a few studies. Uh, but the safety and efficacy studies are still ongoing, uh, and, we, and they are not approved for usual treatment of emphysema patients yet. What about pharmacologic management? Well, we have two different sets of guidelines and two different treatment paradigms, but one has what's confusing for physicians is, is that we have similar pharmacologic agents, and we often use these in both these diseases. I think if you look at the, the pipeline we have for asthma and COPD drugs, this is pretty big, and actually it's enlarging as we speak, so there are more and more drugs being added. Some of these drugs are Me Too drugs, meaning you know more bronchodilators are coming, combination therapies are coming, and only a few uh, new drugs are targeting different um, targets of inflammation or targets of uh, a disease in either COPD and asthma. I think from just looking at the list, there are similarities in a way, and I list anti-inflammatory drugs in asthma because they certainly are the platform in management of asthma. Bronchodilator, as usually, are add-ons, uh, as opposed to COPD, where the platform are bronchodilators, and certainly anti-inflammatory drugs can be considered usually as add-ons, so that's the major paradigm difference between the medications, between asthma and COPD. But you can notice that there are very uh, quite similar drugs in both groups. Some drugs are used only in asthma, uh, some drugs are only used in COPD. 
I talk about this in, in, few, in more detail in the next few slides. Certainly, bronchodilators remain to be important in both these diseases. The use of bronchodilators, however, in asthma COPD is different in a way that short-acting beta agonists can be used when needed in asthma or should be used when needed, can be used on a regular basis in COPD. On the other hand, all guidelines suggest long-acting bronchodilators for maintenance treatment of asthma and COPD. The major difference, however, is long-acting bronchodilators are add-on therapy in asthma, while they can be used as standalone in COPD uh, with no major uh, adverse events or effects. Combining bronchodilators, certainly in COPD arena, more than one that works through different uh, aspects, may improve efficacy and decrease risk of side effects comparing to increasing the dose of single bronchodilator. When you look at response to bronchodilators in asthma COPD, there are some differences, and certainly we don't know, we can't explain all these differences. For example, labo monotherapy in asthma is contraindicated, has been linked to worsening asthma control as well as exacerbation. Similarly, short-acting beta agonists should only be used when needed in asthma. These are, this is not the case in COPD. Anticholinergics right now, the use of anticholinergic is limited to short-acting agents in asthma in exacerbations, although there is mounting evidence now that adding a llama to tropium has been studied as add-on in asthma and may have a role in chronic treatment of asthma, which needs to be identified further. Uh, the anticholinergics are central in management of COPD and certainly in the maintenance treatment short-acting or long-acting antimuscarinic agents can be used on a regular basis, standalone therapy in treatment of COPD. In, uh, uh, theophylline is still there. It hasn't gone from both diseases, especially low-dose theophylline may have potential, uh, 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 potentially it can improve the effect of inhaled steroids in these patients, especially in smokers with asthma and in COPD. But I have to admit the role of low-dose theophylline is still needs to be further evaluated. Now what about anti-inflammatory agents? We know, and Dr. Brayman very elegantly showed the difference in inflammation between asthma and COPD. So we are dealing with two different diseases majority of the time, although there is quite a bit of overlap in the severe asthmatics, for example, and also in patients with COPD exacerbation where eosinophilic inflammation can be seen. In general, inhaled steroids are first line in asthma for the several reasons listed on this slide, and that is not the case in COPD. And inhaled steroids are usually used as add-on therapy in COPD in the high-risk patients in patients in group C and D. The reason the inhaled steroids work in asthma is they have multiple effects on both inflammatory cells as well as structural cells that play a role in asthma. Now, one thing to know about inhaled steroids is that they do need a hist the enzyme system histone deacetylase C2 system, which is very important for steroids to work. Uh, that is usually dysfunctional in patients with COPD, but also in severe asthmatics possibly and in smokers with asthma. So in that population, those patients may have potential resistance to steroids and drugs that can improve the function of HDAC2 system, like low-dose theophylline, may actually improve the effect of inhaled steroids. At least that's one of the mechanisms. So if you look at the summary, with inhaled steroids, uh, the response to inhaled steroids in asthma is certainly very important, although having said that, not all asthmatics respond to inhaled steroids, and there is a potentially 20% of asthmatics that may need other drugs, and they don't have complete response to inhaled steroids. But in general, the, the inhaled steroids have been uh, listed as first-line therapy in asthma. They are, uh, in COPD, there's modest effect on long-term deterioration in lung function, but their main effect is decreasing exacerbation and improving health status. As add-on therapy, there's no role for using inhaled steroid as single agents in, in COPD. There's also a, also a potential of increased risk of pneumonia in COPD, which has not really been uh, described in asthma patients. 
Now, LABAs and, uh, and inhaled steroid combination are popular drugs in both these diseases, but certainly the use of these, this type of combination has been uh, different in a way that in asthma there is a dose response to this type of medication where we have lower doses and medium doses and higher doses. Uh, that has, that those response has not really been well doc documented in COPD. And certainly it's recommended that combination therapy be used in the more severe patients in this disease. And uh, they have been shown to improve symptoms, lung function, and decrease exacerbation. But the long-term effect on declining lung function and mortality in COPD has not been very well documented. Leukotriene modifiers are important agents in asthma. The available drugs target the C4, D4, E4 leukotrienes, which have common receptors, the cis leukotriene 1. This receptor is present on eosinophils and smooth muscle cells. Therefore, the use of these agents are restricted now to asthma who have eosinophilic inflammation. Uh, and their use of COPD has not been recommended, at least the drugs we have available right now. So that's one of the major differences in the pharmacologic treatment. Another difference is IgE plays a major role in, in allergic asthma, a much less role in COPD, and therefore drugs such as uh, amolizumab, which is anti-IgE, is, is restricted right now to therapy in asthmatic patients. Uh, there have been some case reports using it in patients with COPD, but really if you think about how it works, it links to IgE levels, uh, it, to the circulating IgE in patients with this disease. Uh, it really, there shouldn't be any role in the COPD patients. Roflumilast, on the other hand, which is a PD4 inhibitor, you know, is strictly right now approved for patients with severe COPD who have a chronic bronchitis and history of exacerbation. That phenotype of COPD tends to have a better effect in, re in reduction of exacerbation in this uh, in COPD patient, but has not really been or, or approved for asthma, although there's been some cases and some posters and, and abstracts published on the potential use of PD4 inhibitors in asthma. These drugs are not uh, approved at least at this point in this disease. So if, you can, if we summarize the response to other anti-inflammatory therapies in asthma and COPD, leukotriene modifiers have a role as monotherapy in mild asthma and as add-on in uh, more severe disease. There's currently no role for leukotriene modifiers in COPD, at least the ones we have. Um, the anti-IgE therapy has also well-defined role in patients with severe allergic asthma. That has not been the case in COPD. On the other hand, roflumilast, the only PD4 inhibitors approved, is only approved for COPD patients who have a specific phenotype, and that is not the case in asthma. So let's put this all together. Now, in approaching asthma, the level of control is very important to define the step-up approach with pharmacologic therapy. And as you remember, the EPR3 guidelines suggest we go up from uh, step two to up to step six, and you can see that the preferred agents are low-dose inhaled steroid early on. You go up on the inhaled steroids then, and then adding or considering adding a LABA or leukotriene modifier. Uh, and then further up in the stage five and six, these are the ones who end up in our uh, backyard in pulmonary medicine. That's where you may consider adding other things like omeluzumab. And very rarely we need oral steroid chronic therapy, which is something that we avoid in both these diseases we use them only in acute exacerbations. And pharmacologic therapy of, uh, of COPD has certainly uh, has not changed too much. There is a complicated algorithm in the new gold guidelines. That I try to simplify it in a way that all these patients should be receiving rescue medications. Long-acting bronchodilators continue to be the first treatment of choice in COPD in symptomatic patients, considering adding pulmonary rehab early on, especially in those who continue to have symptoms. But adding inhaled steroids or reflumulas should be limited to the grade C and D patients who are at high risk of exacerbations, certainly who are also have severe disease based on lung function. Last slide is, what about acute asthma COPD? There's really not 
too many differences in management of these patients in the emergency department. We really try to give short-acting bronchodilators back to back and buy time for systemic steroids, which are approved or should be used in both uh, these acute exacerbations in short courses. I think the marked difference in, in the way that we have a lower threshold of admission for acute COPD, but also the use of antibiotics are usually more liberal in COPD since bacterial infections are common trigger. That is not the case in, in asthma. The only other dif big difference is the use of non-invasive ventilation, where in acute respiratory failure in COPD, it's been shown to be uh, of a level A evidence that it does work, and that is not the case in asthma. Majority of acute severe asthmatics who don't, who fail the early treatment, may end up unfortunately being intubated. So the take-home messages: one is non-pharmacologic approaches are important in managing asthma and COPD. Certainly, smoking cessation is the most important. In general, current treatment of asthma should target airway inflammation in addition to symptoms, but treatment for COPD is mainly directed to symptom relief. Uh, bronchodilators, inhaled steroids, and other anti-inflammatory agents form the basis in treatment of both asthma and COPD. Uh, although the medications for treating these conditions are similar, the response to treatment and targets of therapy uh, are different owing to differences in pathologic mechanisms. Uh, I will go over some of the questions I showed you early on in, when I presented the case, and then I will introduce our next speaker. Okay, let's go with the questions. So, if you remember, you've seen this slide before, and if you remember my case, which one of the following lab tests may help differentiate asthma from COPD? A chest X-ray, lung volume measurement showing hyperinflation and gas trapping, DLCO, or IgE level? Okay, 48% got it right. So certainly IgE level is really not helpful in differentiating because some patients with COPD have IgE level. Okay, next. In differentiating asthma from COPD, which statement is true about spirometry? Significant bronchodilatory response confirms diagnosis of asthma. Bronchodilatory response does not differentiate asthma from COPD. The absence of significant bronchodilatory response confirms diagnosis of COPD. The post bronchodilator FEV1 FVC less than 70% confirms the diagnosis of asthma. Okay. In differentiating asthma from COPD, which statement is true about chest X-ray? Presence of hyperinflation on chest X-ray is diagnostic of COPD. Chest X-ray is not a useful tool for differentiating asthma from COPD. Hyperinflation on chest X-ray is primarily caused by underlying emphysema, and chest X-ray is not usually required for the initial workup of patients with asthma or COPD. All right, next, the last one, I think. Which statement is true regarding management of asthma COPD? Pharmacologic management of asthma COPD should focus on managing respiratory symptoms. Inhaled steroids are pivotal medication in both asthma and COPD as airway inflammation is present in both diseases. Response to inhaled bronchodilators in COPD is primarily due to the decrease in hyperinflation of the lungs. 
monotherapy with LABAS should be avoided in both asthma and COPD. Well, only 34% got this right, and it, it is the way bronchodilators work, is by decreasing hyperinflation. And certainly chest X-ray hyperinflation does not only reflect emphysema, but also the airway obstruction. And, all right? So uh, we'll move on. So I want to introduce my dear uh, colleague, uh, Professor Mario Cazzola. He's Professor of Respiratory Medicine and Director of the Postgraduate School of Respiratory Medicine at the University of Rome, Tor Vergata. And um, I would like to uh, say that uh, Dr. Cazola, uh, Professor Cazola is very well known with his uh, work in bronchodilator and uh, has been a great mentor for me as, over the years. I will show a couple of questions that he prepared. I have to admit I had to think twice to, with, to get the responses, so let me share with you the questions and then I'll introduce them. Okay, first question. New uh, antimuscarinic antagonists are long-acting compared to teotropium because, choose one, they are less susceptible, they are dosed higher, they accumulate in the lungs, they are more highly protein-bound, the mechanism is not clear. Okay, RPL554 is an experimental bronchodilator affecting which targets? BDA2 adrenergic and muscarinic uh, receptors, PDE3, PDE4, uh, PI3 kinase, RHO kinase, phospholipase C, adenylate cyclase. That's the question I had problems with. I'm sure he's going to explain, I hope. Okay, I think that's it, right? Thank you very much, Nick. Thanks to ACCP for having invited me also this year. Uh, these are my conflicts of interest. Well, uh, Nick has uh, clearly uh, stressed the importance of both bronchodilators and anti-inflammatory agents in asthma and COPD. Because of the time, I cannot describe all emerging uh, therapies for asthma and COPD. I will be focusing on COPD, and if you wish, on uh, uh, the specific asthmatic phenotype that is the neutrophilic uh, asthma. Well, uh, thinking about the bronchodilators, we know that our airways are under the control of parasympathetic nerves, but also we have an indirect uh, sympathetic influence, and this is the reason why over the years there is a, a big interest in developing beta-2 agonists, antimuscarinic agents, and also uh, Xanthimethylates that can influence the uh, beta 2 adrenal receptor activation cascade. However, we now are looking for new uh, targets, and this is possible if we look at the main intracellular pathways that are involved in the bronchomotor tone regulation. Uh, all this information are in a large paper that we have published in the June issue of. Uh, pharmacological reviews, and if you will write me, I will send you a PDF of this paper. Well, in this paper, we have stressed that we have several classes. Selective phosphodiesterase inhibitors, potassium channel openers, vasoactive intestinal peptide analogs, rokinase inhibitors, brain nitric peptide analogs, nit uh, nitric oxide donors, e prostrenoid receptor for agonists, and bitter test receptor agonists. You can see huge a group of bronchodilators or new targets that can be developed. Uh, at the present time, we believe that uh, the combination of the uh, possibility of blocking both PD3 and PD4 uh, uh, enzyme uh, is extremely important because such a type of approach 
as an additive and synergic anti-inflammatory and bronchodilator effect versus either PD3 or PD4 alone. For this reason, we have tested, and I am showing you for the first time in US data that we have produced in my lab, uh, testing RPL554. RPL is a, a drug that is under development by Verona Pharma, a UK and Canadian company in COPD. And you can see that the drug that was administered by inhalation was able to induce uh, a large bronchodilation that was not really long lasting. But uh, what was intriguing was that there was no correlation between uh, bronchodilation induced by salbutamol and RPL 554. Uh, now, uh, Dev Singh in UK is looking at the anti inflammatory effect of this drug that has been tested also in asthmatic patients in the Netherlands with uh, successful uh, results. Um, we have now another large program, and uh, I hope that next year we will be able to show more important data. It's uh, clear that to date it's extremely difficult to find new classes of bronchodilator, and for this reason many researchers group have uh, focused the attention of the possibility of improving the existing class of bronchodilators. And uh, mainly, they are looking at how to create uh, new ligands that interact with the beta-2 adrenal receptors and the uh, muscarinic receptors uh, in, so that they can enhance their bronchodilator effectiveness and duration of action. And this could allow once daily administration. And uh, in effect, we have two in the catalog is already uh, in the market, both in US and uh, Europe and many other countries, although here in this country you have the problem of the dosage that is only 75 micrograms, whereas in Europe we use 150 micrograms and 300 micrograms. In any case, uh, uh, this is was, uh, I, can, the, I can consider it the prototype of uh, uh, what I call uh, ultra lab, but we have other ultra labs, ultra because of the duration of action, not because of the potence of the bronchodilation. Well, you can see that there are two compounds that are in phase three, bilanterol here, results coming from the paper published by Nicanania, and olodaterol, the paper published by uh, Van Nord. And uh, both are really in large phase three trials. But uh, we have also other compounds that are in phase one and phase two, AZD3199, AstraZeneca, this is in phase two. It's strange that this compound was unable to induce a dose-dependent increase in lung function. And this led me to think about the reality of the interferences with the with beta-2 receptors. Um, this PF is 610355, is a Pfizer drug, but I know to the best of my knowledge, that Pfizer has stopped the development of bronchodilators. And abediterol is an almiral compound that the first clinical results seem to indicate as a really intriguing compound. I don't know if almiral will give this drug to forest in, your, in this country. Obviously, because theotropium is the gold standard in the treatment of COPD, all companies that uh, are involved in the development of bronchodilator are looking uh, in uh, the possibility of uh, 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 developing new uh, uh, lamas. And in effect, we have already three compounds, glicopyronium NVA-237 by Novartis, umeclidinium by GSK, and acridinium by Almiral Forest. Uh, glicopyronium and acridinium have received the approval from the uh, European Medicinal Agency, and acridinium has been launched in Denmark and in, in Spain. Here you can see the results of uh, uh, glicopyronium when it was tested versus placebo and theotropium uh, on once a daily basis. This was the GLOW2 trial, and uh, apparently there was no difference between the two compounds in uh, um, inducing bronchodilation and in influencing uh, uh, the onset of severe COPD exacerbation. Umeclidinium has just been presented in very small uh, results. And here the, you can see the, uh, the, the study published by Jim Danui. Um, 
there was a, a real uh, intriguing uh, effecta eff effectiveness in this drug. It was able to induce uh, once daily bronchodilation. Uh, in this study, Jim compared this drug administered once daily with the same dosage uh, administered on twice daily basis with no differences, as you can see. Uh, acridinium is a really intriguing compound. It started as once a daily compound, but now uh, we know that it will be in the market as a twice daily compound. And uh, this study was uh, really intriguing, uh, just published in Trest, because it documented that the bronchodilation induced by acridinium of 400 microgram twice a daily uh, was larger than that induced by theotropium on once a daily basis. There are a lot of other uh, anti-muscarinic agents that are in uh, phase one, phase two clinical trials. We have published all this list in uh, a paper that has been published in the October issue of Expert Opinion in Pharmacotherapy. Uh, I have no time to enter in, in all this, but uh, in my problem, I think, and this uh, general problem is uh, the fact that we still do not know whether these anti-muscarinic agents are really long-lasting, or whether they have a longer duration of action only because they uh, increase in the dosage of the, 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 the drug to overcome the shorter duration of action, uh, they accumulate uh, in the lung. And I think that this is the case. There is a very nice paper published by Steve Calton. Uh, he works in, at Novartis uh, Development Center that stresses this point. And uh, in any case, uh, uh, since now we are focused on uh, the control of nocturnal symptoms uh, uh, and those present on awakening also in COPD, I think that the twice daily dosing of bronchodilators will still be considered a useful approach to the symptomatic treatment of COPD. But in any case, what we wish to have, mainly in COPD patients, is, is the maximization of bronchodilation. And uh, we know that it's possible to obtain this or increasing the dosage of a single bronchodilator or combining two bronchodilators with different mechanisms of action. And here you can see how it's possible to combine a beta-2 agonist and anti-muscarinic agent if you influence the beta-2 receptors that are present on the pre-junctional uh, synapsis, you can influence the potassium-calcium-dependent channel. In this manner, you can decrease the release of acetylcholine. And this is a very good reason to combine a beta-2 receptor agonist and uh, uh, an anti-muscarinic uh, uh, agent. And in any case, you know very well the, the trial that has been conducted both in US and in Europe, published by Don Mahler in Thorax this year, in which there was a clear documentation that the combination of indacaterol plus uh, theotropium was more effective than theotropium alone. But in this study, the, uh, the two drugs were administered using different devices. And now the, there is an effort to combine two drugs in the same inhaler. Here you can see the first data coming from uh, uh, QVA 149, that is the combination of indacatarol with glicopyronium, the study that was present, published in 2010 by Van Nord, and the, uh, the data that uh, Eric Batman has presented in Vienna during the last uh, year as Congress. And you can see that the combination of uh, the two drugs uh, uh, was more effective than monocomponents. And uh, also the combination of uh, olodaterol and theotropium uh, seems to be more effective than uh, in this study of uh, than theotropium alone. But please consider that uh, during the last year's Congress, uh, they have uh, also presented data looking at uh, fixed dosage of olodaterol at different doses of theotropium with the same results. Another possibility is to combine, and this is useful also for asthma, to combine uh, uh, ultralaba with a once daily inhaled corticosteroid. Here you can see uh, results from fluticasone furate with lanterol. Uh, it seems that this combination is extremely effective, although during the last year as Congress, it was shown that this combination was not better than the combination of salmeterol and fluticasone propionate. 
We have uh, several possibilities again. I have no time to enter in all these uh, combinations, but you can see that all companies are trying to combine uh, two bronchodilators with different mechanisms of action of a lab with uh, uh, an anal corticosteroid or even a lama with an anal corticosteroid. But what is really attracting is the possibility of having a single molecule able to uh, block muscarinic receptors and to activate beta-2 receptors, what we call MABAS. And now uh, Jess Kay uh, has presented the data coming from a, a large trial, in, in which, phase two large trial, to be honest, in which they were able to document that this compound was more effective than a beta-2 agonist and anti-muscarinic agent. Uh, what we do in real life in severe patients is, is to combine three active drugs. And uh, now there is an attempt to combine the three drugs in a single inhaler. In India, they have such a type of uh, combination, but what, as, a, uh, as a clinical pharmacologists, we believe is that it's crucial that each drug has an identical deposition pattern and reach the same epithelial localization simultaneously. That means that uh, devices are extremely important. Um, so uh, I think that uh, at the conclusion of bronchodilators, it's like that the MABAS will be considered the real advance in bronchodilator therapies. Other things are just marketing activities. I can say useful, but marketing activities. Uh, in the September issue of uh, ERJ, we have published also the possibility of finding new drugs able to induce anti-inflammatory activity because of the problem of steroid uh, uh, inactivity in COPD. And we have uh, uh, listed a long list of uh, compounds, as you can see. I have no time to enter into this. You can read the paper. Uh, in this paper, we have stressed the, the pro and the cons of all compounds. But what is important is that we have a long list of compounds that are now under uh, development and under clinical investigation. What is also important is that PD-4 inhibitors that have been tested by inhalation were ineffective. And this is something that uh, led us to think about the importance of uh, uh, how deliver drugs to reduce side effect, but also to be effective. Also, adenosine uh, 2A, uh, IA 2 a uh, receptor agonists are extremely important, so, and also uh, drugs that uh, can influence uh, adhesion molecules. Uh, in the same paper, we have tried to uh, show the targets that we have to uh, the potential target that we have for new drugs in patients with COPD. Here you can see the possibility of influencing uh, mainly chemokine receptors. But we know also that we can influence the canonical and non-canonical pathways of nuclear factor and uh, KB, and also that uh, we can uh, induce the inhibition of PE38 map kinase, because this is expected to inhibit not only the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, but also uh, their action, uh, and in this manner they can interrupt the issues circle that often occur in COPD. But we can also uh, influence the uh, MK2, uh, that is a downstream substrate of P38 MAP kinase. Uh, and this is a... a, 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 a in my opinion, another excellent target for anti-inflammatory therapy. Uh, we have also the possibility of uh, uh, influencing uh, the phosphorinositol the three kinase, um, and uh, this is a, a too specific, maybe, uh, target, and uh, I don't know if this will be useful, but many companies are working on this target. And in fact, you can see here, again, the long list of uh, compounds that uh, are under development with their pro and con, and considering the single classes of compounds, I just show you because of the time, uh, all these possibilities. But what I want also to stress is the possibility that we can reverse the molecular mechanism of glucocorticosteroid by restoring HDAC2 activity or inhibiting PGB. And in effect, uh, if we use uh, theophylline or resveterol, uh, we can do the, this effect. There are some British studies that seem mainly 
sponsored by Peter, sponsored, driven by Peter Barnes, that try to document that this, and Neil Thompson as well, that trying to document that this is the case. But we cannot forget that also bronchodilator can induce anti-inflammatory activity, and we cannot uh, forget the importance of antioxidant strategies and the proteasis inhibitors. At the end, and sorry if I was really fast, but they told me that it's really late. Uh, we can discuss. In any case, I will remain here if you want to discuss with me. I think that the only rofluminas that, as you know, uh, and as Nick has stressed, uh, uh, that is an oral uh, active PD-4 inhibitor, as you know, has reached the market for the treatment of COPD, although in Europe, not in this country. Uh, all the other new pharmacological anti-inflammatory approaches tests in human have been found ineffective or bounded by major side effects. I think that the full development of novel anti-inflammatory agents might be uh, problematic because the current use of the clinical assessment of patients with COPD are not indicative of the inflammatory process. And also, uh, we have problems in really differentiate asthma and COPD because as Professor Brahman has stressed before, a lot of patients suffer from overlap syndrome and this creates problems in understanding uh, our anti-inflammatory agents. And my final conclusion, unfortunately, is that despite the advances made in the this area, there are still significant gaps in our understanding. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Cazola. We're, I know we're short of time, but we're gonna take questions. Let me just show the two questions he showed and then we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, so the first question is new, uh, anti-muscarinic antagonists are long-lasting or long-acting compared to TO because they are less susceptible, they are dosed higher, they accumulate in the lungs, they are more highly protein-bound, or the mechanism is not clear. Okay, so the 44% got the mechanism, the accumulate in the lung, which is the right answer. Although I, my answer was the mechanism is not clear, but <laughs> Professor Casola <laughs> tells me, no, they do accumulate in the lung. Okay, and next. RPL554 is an experimental bronchodilator affecting which target? Choose one. It is a PD3, PD4, very early in development. You saw the results. All right. So we're going to get uh, take some questions. We well, have questions here, and then we'll open it up for the audience. I know some of you may have to go to the Congress, and that's perfectly fine. But uh, we really want to answer. So the first question, uh, if the goal of COPD management is symptom control, and your patient uh, has no symptoms on albirol when needed, alone, is there any objective finding you use to try to insist that they, are, that they take another therapy? I think, I think that's a very important question in a way, and one thing that I want to make sure I allude to is, uh, is that you want to make sure these patients are, are, are asymptomatic, because that's the key, because many of these patients actually undermine their symptoms, and unless you ask direct questions or targeted questions, you may miss that they are symptomatic indeed. So a very bad question for this patient is, how are you doing? You know, that's a pretty bad question. So you have to ask about activity limitation, cough, sputum. Uh, using the CAT questionnaire may help you because they have, it's built in, these, some of these questions are built in. But there is no proof now that if patient is completely asymptomatic, to use maintenance therapy. At least the guidelines don't suggest we do it. There's no evidence. Now, the lack of evidence doesn't mean it, it's not there, but the reason is the interventions we have don't change the natural history of the disease. Sydney, you have a question there? Yes, there was a question about uh, exhaled NO, uh, and uh, uh, why, are, why is it not distinguishing, and what's the source of exhaled NO in asthma? Well, NO has been associated with eosinophil inflammation in the lungs. So when eosinophils go down, NO goes down. 
Uh, and uh, as you saw from the, uh, some of the slides I showed, the eosinophilic, eosinophilic inflammation can be the present in COPD and hence uh, NO could be elevated. Uh, so so what, was, what has been shown is that they're really not a good distinguishing test between asthma and COPD. Okay, there's a couple of questions on omelizumab. One is, uh, and maybe Mario, you can take that. Uh, it's on anti-IG omelizumab. When, if ever, do you stop it? Uh, do you stop it and, and, and when and how? And the other question about omelizumab, do you use it in COPD? Did well, you want to the, pick on? The first question is that ideally we must never stop omelizumab. Uh, there is uh, a trial coming from US, if I remember well, that, that documented that uh, uh, after five years of treatment, uh, uh, if you, uh, the patients were uh, uh, withdrawn by this treatment, well, there was again an increase in IgE. So it means that in any case, patients must remain under continuous treatment with IgE. About uh, COPD, uh, what is the reason? The increase in, uh, induced by smoke of Ig, I don't think that is an unspecific Ig uh, mm -hmm. amount, not, mm -hmm. not a specific. So there is no sense to administer malinzumab in COPD. Mm -hmm. In rhinitis, it's extremely important, mm -hmm. but uh, in, at least in Europe, we cannot do it. Because in Europe, uh, the only possibility to treat pa our patient with uh, omalizumab is severe Asthma. Mm -hmm. Same, here Same here in the U.S. The question, changes in treatment when asthma or COPD is associated with morbid obesity, kyphosis or kyphoscoliosis, is there a question, question mark nebulizers versus MDI? Um, and, and certainly, you, I mean, the person who wrote this question brings a very important point about the delivery systems, which we did not address in our discussion today. But I think it's, it has to do with the patient acceptability, the patient's physical and uh, mental condition, because obviously we de definitely use devices, uh, and there are drugs that are limited to certain devices, but if patients have very weak respiratory muscles or have cognitive dysfunction or physical dysfunction in their hands that they cannot use the inhalers, then obviously you need to look at other delivery systems. And nebulization has been, has been popular in the U.S. as opposed to other countries and certainly may benefit some patients who cannot use regular DPIs or MDIs. Uh, there's a question here about theophylin. Use of theophylin early in the disease uh, in either COPD or asthma. Sydney, did you want to take on this? Although it's, it's. Well, theophylin is certainly in, in the algorithm, but it really is not a first line therapy. Third line. So it would be at least third line. So no, you would not use it usually earlier in the disease. Yeah. And uh, as you heard from the lecture, there is some evidence that maybe uh, because of the HDAC story, it might be useful, particularly in steroid non-responsive uh, patients. Uh, but this is something that I think the story that's still evolving. This is a question on beta blockers in COPD and the uh, effect on decreased mortality, and certainly it's an area of interest to me. Uh, so the, the data on beta blockers, you know, early on beta blockers were totally contraindicated in COPD, and now we know beta-1 selective blockers can be used if patient has underlying cardiac uh, reason for it. But there are some observational trials published over the last couple of years showing in large epidemiologic studies beta blockers have been linked to improving uh, survival and decrease exacerbations, even when used for hypertension in these patients. Now, you have to look at these data with a grain of salt because you, they are not controlled trials, prospective trials. So all what these studies show is that there may be a signal. I think we have to wait for somebody who's very courageous who would take this in, and do prospective trials on these. We are doing studies on beta blockers in asthma right now, and we have an NIH-funded protocol at Baylor. It's a totally different disease. We're looking at airway hyperresponsiveness, but there is pharmacologically potential uh, um, value for exploring this because, uh, you know, it may be a paradigm shift, just like what happened with heart failure, where at one time these drugs were totally contraindicated. I know Professor Casola has some interest in this area as well. Did you want to add anything, or to Dr. Brayman? I, I completely agree with what you stressed. We have a, a large discussion yes, two we weeks ago in uh, Catania, in Sicily, during the Italian Congress of Respiratory Medicine, 
I stressed that uh, retrospective analysis seems to indicate that beta-2 blockers, uh, beta blockers in general, mainly uh, cardiac beta blockers, so beta-1, beta selective beta-1, were not, uh, seems not to be uh, dangerous. In any case, I wrote uh, an editorial for the Blue Journal uh, three or four years ago, and with my wife, uh, we stressed the importance uh, of being careful in, in any case in using beta blockers in COPD and asthma as well. The last, one last question is about raflumilase. What's the evidence that it gives additional benefit to severe COPD who are already on combination therapy and LAMA? The trials that, the pivotal trials that have been published looked at raflumilase added to patients on LABA or short-acting anticholinergics. There are ongoing studies now looking at how it works when added to the long-acting beta agonist inhaled steroid combination and LAMA. We don't have clinical trials that have addressed this at least uh, from the uh, pivotal studies. I'm going to cut it uh, short now. We're going to try to end because it's 7.30 and, and one of our faculty has to be in, in the conference center. He has to fly over there to get there at 7.30. But it's a pleasure for us to host you this morning and I'd like to thank the organizer, the France Foundation and ACCP for putting this together and uh, I hope to see you around in the meeting. Thank you very much.